There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, demonstrate to you a, um, a beautiful invention of the uh, early 19th century, the galvanometer, which will indicate a quantity of electricity um, and also in which direction it is flowing. And uh, it came to be very important by the mid 19th century uh, when they were laying the transatlantic telegraph cables, which we will come to. Uh, but when did this electric current, you know, a charge, a current of electricity flowing through a conductor, um, usually a wire of iron or co copper, um, when did this all start? Well, this is Alessandro Volta, um, and in 1800 um, he published the fact that he had uh, constructed um, an electric battery that would provide um, a constant current for some time. And here is one, and the uh, credits for this uh, Wikipedia photograph is in the video description. Um, it consists of alternating layers of three things, a disc of copper, a disc of zinc, and then a piece of cloth um, to separate them, uh, which is soaked in salt solution. And then th that's a cell, and the cell is repeated up his uh, tower there, which is why it's called a voltaic pile. And in fact, uh, uh, even now the French for uh, a battery is uh, la pile. And as soon as news of this got about, it was fascinating to people because although static electricity uh, and magnetism had been known for centuries and investigated, this was the first time you could have a continuous current. So people rushed to make their own batteries and to pass an electric current through various things. This is Sir Humphrey Davy in 1830, but before he was Sir Humphrey, back in 1800, uh, he passed uh, an electric current through a thin wire. Now, uh, we can do that too. Here we go. Three, two, one. Ooh. A powerful current of electricity passing through a thin wire um, heats it up because there is some resistance in the copper to the current flowing. And that comes, so work is done, that comes out as heat. And if it's uh, strong enough, it'll melt the wire. Um, so actually, I mean, Humphrey Davy invented hundreds of things, uh, but he just invented the electric fuse, which is something which will melt on purpose. If the current's too high, it melts and everything gets switched off. So that was great. He then went on to um, heat platinum, which was a very high melting point with his super battery. Um, now, I haven't got any platinum, but the fact is it got, went up to 16, 1700 degrees centigrade and it emitted, a, 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 that's practically white hot, uh, it put out a light. And so here was a hint of future uh, lighting by electricity. And then he went on to do something else, which we can also show you. He also made an electric arc uh, between two pieces of charcoal. I haven't got any charcoal, so I'm using carbon. Say so that's cool, isn't it? An electric arc. That went quite well, actually, didn't it? Um, and of course, uh, heating of metal, uh, albeit in a vacuum, and carbon arc were both used much, much later on um, for providing light. And so all these things were being foreshadowed. Two other people also in 1800 passed an electric current through water. Now, water, if it's pure, doesn't conduct electricity. But if you put a little bit of something like sodium chloride, common salt in it, it will conduct electricity and then something very interesting happens as I'm sure you know. And here we are, bubbles are rising in this tube and also in the other. Now something has gone wrong because this is supposed to be hydrogen and this is supposed to be oxygen and of course we know that water is H2O and there's supposed to be twice as much um, hydrogen as there is oxygen and for some reason that's not working but um, so you can't win them all. Now the hydrogen tube is full and uh, because hydrogen is uh, much lighter than air, if we take out the tube, it will still have the hydrogen in it. Therefore we can light it and get the characteristic, with any luck, get the characteristic pop. Which we do. 
As a spin-off from the electrolysis of water, there was also an electrolytic telegraph which was developed um, first in Spain in 1804 and then uh, in 1809 by uh, the German uh, von Sermering. Um, so, but that deserves a video to itself, to be honest. Um, and um, the Sermering telegraph didn't really get off the ground because it had a tube for each letter. It bubbled up in the tubes and it needed 35 wires to operate. Uh, it did work over three and a half kilometers, uh, but it never uh, got off the ground much further because of the complexity of the cable. Um, so you're asked now, when do we get to the galvanometer? And um, it's right now, except there's one last thing we must cover. Yes, we mustn't forget uh, electroplating, which was uh, down to Brunetelli in 1805. And so we've got some iron here, old transformer laminations, and a copper sulphate solution. Uh, however, it's fair to point out that copper will be deposited on iron without electricity if you put it in. Um, there will be a certain amount. So I'm going to put it in and time it for five minutes um, and uh, come back and have a look at it after five minutes. Okay, here it is after five minutes. And uh, as you can see, there's a, a, a jolly nice uh, layer of copper on it. Uh, but if we take a tissue and uh, wipe it off, uh, it's not very substantial and it's gone. And that is, of course, because the copper deposited uh, shields the, the iron from the further deposition. Uh, so what we do now is make it an electrode here and we'll put it back in and set the timer going again for five minutes. Um, And I can see some little bubbles rising off it, that's hydrogen of course. So we'll come back and see how it's getting on after five minutes. And here we go. There are actually crystals growing out of the bottom. There is a layer of copper on there. And um, if I wipe it with the tissue, uh, it may not adhere perfectly. In fact, it doesn't. But you'll see here that there's actually tons of, of, of copper. Uh, on the tissue. It hasn't adhered to the metal uh, for some reason, but there it is. What about the galvanometer? Uh, no problem. Um, Hans Christian Ørsted, the Danish scientist, uh, in 1820 um, made a breakthrough which was absolutely staggeringly uh, important. Um, they had tried to measure electricity before, but it was difficult and tedious, and you couldn't measure it on the hoof. But Ersted uh, solved that, and much more besides. Ersted was passing uh, an electric current through a wire, and this wire is pointing north and south, as it happens. And, um, and there was a compass nearby. And um, actually, I'll put it on top. When he completed the circuit, he noticed this, that the compass needle swung to one side and he thought that was extremely curious. When he removed the current it went back and if he changed the polarity of his battery the needle swung the other way um, and when he took it off it went back to normal. That was an epoch making discovery because Ersted had discovered the fact that electricity and magnetism which hitherto had always been separate they're actually related to each other indeed different forms of the same thing uh, and the you know the consequences of this were absolutely incredible um, because the opposite is also true that was discovered soon by Faraday that if you move a magnet near a wire or a coil of wire then an electric current is induced in that coil, in that wire, and so everything's based on that. Um, but more to the point, you could use a compass needle, the deflection of it would be proportional to the current flowing through the wire. So here at last is something to measure electricity very conveniently, and it was uh, called the galvanometer, that's named after Galvani, who was the predecessor of Volta, uh, the chap who saw that frog legs moved when you touched them with different metals. I mean Galvani thought the electricity was generated organically but we 
uh, Volta said, no, I don't think so. It's to do with two different metals in, a, in an electrolyte. Anyway, now we had a galvanometer. They soon had purpose-made galvanometers. Uh, this one's actually from the 1950s, but it's exactly the same. Uh, it doesn't look, it looks more like 1850s, but no, it works fine. Um, and it's calibrated in degrees. So if we pass a current through this wire, there will be a deflection. And you can read it off on this scale. Of course, that's why the mirror's there. It's a bit tarnished, but uh, it's reading, shall we say, 57 degrees. If you increase the current through it, which I can do by operating this variable resistor, the deflection gets bigger. Um, and so this is a way of measuring a quantity of electricity. It's quite sensitive, as you can see, because it's just picking up the magnetic field uh, along this single wire. And you could make such galvanometers much more sensitive by winding a, a coil of many turns of fine wire around them and they would become even more sensitive. And uh, by the time they were laying the transatlantic telegraph cables uh, in the 1850s, uh, they definitely needed some very sensitive detector of electricity. This is Johann Christian Poggendorf. Um, he's quite old in this picture, but in uh, 1826, that would have been when he was 30, he thought of putting a mirror uh, in a galvanometer instead of a pointer, because you could then shine a light, uh, and as the uh, magnet, the little tiny magnet, was deflected, the beam of light would be deflected onto a scale so that you could have a much longer pointer. And of course that pointer was weightless, so it was a beautifully elegant invention. Now comes... Sir William Thompson, seen here in 1867. Um, he was knighted in 1866 uh, for his part uh, in the success of the transatlantic cable of that year. Um, there had been one before, but it uh, burnt out um, because they used too much power. In 1865 and 66, two cables were laid across the Atlantic from Ireland to Newfoundland, 1,800 miles long, roughly. And um, Thomson had said we must operate these on low power. And in order to do that, they needed a very, very sensitive meter. And he refined the mirror galvanometer so that it would read very tiny signals uh, coming through the cable. OK, after all this waffle, it's about time we had a demonstration of a mirror galvanometer. Uh, and I have one here which I picked up quite cheap at a science radio rally uh, and it's got a date, what I think is a date on it, which is uh, January 1929, so it's quite old. It's not as old as, as uh, Thompson or later he was Lord Kelvin, it's not as old as a Kelvin a galvanometer and it's not the sort that was used on the transatlantic cable, uh, but it is one and because I like a bit of fun I decided to set it up using something which even the great scientists of the 19th century didn't have, which is one of these, which is a laser pointer. Now I figured if you shone a laser pointer into a mirror galvanometer, you could have a pointer which was uh, perhaps 40 or 50 feet long. And, uh, and I've done it, and it's, I hope you'll find it's fun. Here we have a step ladder and a piece of plywood and the um, mirror galvanometer and a standard cell four 5.6 mega ohm resistors in series with soldered joints uh, a meter for measuring the voltage although we know roughly what it is uh, and here the laser pointer which will shine its beam into the mirror galvanometer and which will be reflected from the mirror and it will go up the garden and the spot from the galvanometer will shine on the garden shed um, just below the window. We've set it up last night uh, and so when it gets dark uh, we shall perform the test. Uh, it's actually dusk uh, but the camera's working fine and uh, below the three shed windows uh, you can see a spot, a diagonal spot as it happens, um, below the middle of the three windows and the, the uh, galvanometer has now come to rest and we're looking at a distance of between 40 and 50 feet. Uh, I shall now go inside and apply the battery to the galvanometer.
ready. Oops. I've slightly disturbed it. We'll just have to let it um, settle again. I shall now apply the standard cell to the galvanometer. Ah, the spot has moved. Now I shall remove the battery from the galvanometer. And it's moved back. So there we have a deflection of the spot uh, on a light pointer somewhere between 40 and 50 feet long. So the test is a success. Now we need to work out the actual amount of current. It's just measured. OK, now to do our calculation. Uh, here we have volts equals amps times ohms. And of course, none of these quantities had been formalised in the middle of the 19th century. They were only all arranged to, to coordinate uh, probably around 1890, I think. Uh, more formally, E, electromotive force, equals I, the current, times the resistance. And so putting in the values, we have 1.018 volts from our standard Western cell times the current times 22,770,000 ohms giving us I equals 1.018 divided by 22,770,000. Here we go then, 1.018 divided by 2277 equals, there we are, uh, well, we'll call that 4.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Well, I'm going to round up that 4.5 to 5, and I make that 5 hundredths of a microamp, which is a really tiny current. Uh, I'm not sure what the currents were that flowed across the uh, Atlantic, but they were pretty small and needed specialist equipment to read them. Uh, so thanks for watching. Sorry it's gone on a bit. Uh, but the good old technology uh, can still be employed um, to see how it works and have a bit of fun. Bye now. In the equilibrium of kinetic averages in any solid or liquid, every individual electron must occasionally have so high a velocity that it is shot out of the body. Hence, every solid or liquid body has something of radioactivity. The radium atom must, so far as we can at present judge, be assumed to have a special property of being adapted to store enormously more energy by an electron within it.